what brought me away from atheism and, quote, back to faith were the themes of love. I couldn't make sense of my deep intuitions that I ought to be a person who loves and other people ought to be loving people if there wasn't a God who grounded that intuition. Hello, and welcome to More Than Sunday, a weekly podcast where we take a deeper dive into the stories, themes, and questions of our faith. My name is Eric Chikowski. I'm one of the worship directors here at First United Methodist Church Richardson. And with me every week are two of our associate pastors, Julie Richter and Josh Fitzpatrick. Hey, guys. Hey, how's it going? Hey, Eric, it's good to be here again. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So this is a huge week for one of the people in this room. Who is it? <laughs> our own Julie Richter. It's and me. and one of the people out of this room, quite honestly, who works a ton on this podcast, <laughs> our own Julie Richter is getting married to our producer Kyle Henson on Yay. Saturday. It's kind of a big deal. It is. It's, it's kind wedding of week. A big deal. It's wedding week. It yeah. is wedding. Week. How's wedding week going? You know, it's a little stressful. Yeah, but it's good. All the pieces We're ready. coming together. Yeah. Well, it's nice because it's actually also spring break week, and so Fair. you know, while other people are going skiing and at Disney World, we're just you know planning a wedding. Yeah. No big deal. <laughs> no, no big, big deal. deal. Yeah. <laughs> But we're very excited. It's going to be a lot of fun. We are thrilled for you both and excited for the weekend. Another thing we're excited about is our guest today, who is an author, a theologian, a philosopher of what we might say is provocative theology, theology that makes us think outside our box. And I think that's good for a church family to do or for anybody really to do, to be able to take the beliefs that you've grown up with and say, why do I believe these things? And, and how might I invite other perspectives into my sense of systematic theology? Also, we wanted to let you know that there's some discussion of sexual abuse in this episode and one quick bit of language. So if you have kids with you, maybe wait to listen, but make sure you come back to it. You really don't want to miss this interview. So here's our conversation with Dr. Thomas J. Ord. Today we're joined by Dr. Thomas J. Ord, who is a philosopher and a theologian. He's an ordained elder in the Church of the Nazarene, and it is a pleasure. We're excited to have you here today. Yeah, it's so good to be talking with the three of you. I just want to jump into and have you paint a little bit of background for us, if you will. What drew you initially into the field of philosophy and theology? Well, I I think I've always been asking questions and philosophy, theology, and science. I do a lot of science work and reading science. I'm not a practicing scientist, but I do a lot of reading in that field as well. Those are the disciplines that typically ask the biggest questions of life and seek the most plausible answers. So I think I was sort of drawn toward those fields because I'm the kind of person who wants to know why things are the way they are, or at least have, you know, some sort of good proposal for an answer of why things are the way they are. And so you teach, you teach philosophy, you teach theology. What do you enjoy about not just obtaining the knowledge for yourself, but then challenging your students and spreading that knowledge? Well, you know, I probably connect most quickly to other people who are asking questions and probably also to people who have not been satisfied with the answers that they've been given from their parents, their community, their church, their teachers. So people who are thirsty to understand life, to live life well, to help others live life well, and are looking for ways of thinking, ways of living, ways of being in the world that make sense and are helpful. A lot of the people that I teach are headed for pastoral ministry of some sort, or maybe I should just say ministry of some sort. So they're thinking in their mind that they would like to be part-time, full-time, work in the church or parachurch organizations. And so I want them to be stretched to think about who God is and how we ought to live. 
Yeah. So when I first started in seminary, I was told to not expect to get all of the answers, that you don't go to <laughs> seminary to get all of the answers, but instead to ask big questions. So so I love that. So as you're teaching these classes, you know, you have a handful of students that will pursue the academy. But as you said, many will be pursuing a calling into the ministry of the local church. So how does the fact that many of your students who will be future pastors in your class shape the way that you teach? Well, I want to provide language that the average person can understand while simultaneously helping students learn the more technical and precise language of the academy. So I think people who can operate in both worlds have a real advantage in living well in the world and helping others. If you're able to understand some of the deep language and concepts, but articulate them and formulate them in your own mind in ways that make sense. I think that's a real gift, not only to others, but also to yourself. I also think our theology has to be actually livable. You know, if you've got ideas that don't really make sense in the way you live our lives, then most of the time those ideas are false. Let me give you an example. In the Church of the Nazarene, we have a special emphasis on the doctrine of entire sanctification. Methodists have this too, but Nazarenes, you probably hear this language more often in a Church of the Nazarene service or a district assembly. And one way to think about entire sanctification is to call it a life of being sinless, a life of never, ever sinning. And that sounded so attractive to me when I first heard it. And I gave myself over to that, said prayers, went to the altar, you know, gave my life to Jesus, got entirely sanctified, all that kind of language, thinking that I would never sin again. In fact, I remember one particular evening at a little church in Royal City, Washington, going to the altar and laying it all down and feeling like, you know, on cloud nine. I was pure, I was clean, and according to the evangelist, I could now live a sin-free life. And I remember thinking about two or three days later as I'm making out with my girlfriend and doing (laughs) things that uh, are probably not uh, appropriate with my girlfriend, thinking, whatever happened to that sinlessness that I thought I had a couple of nights ago? (laughs) And so um, I do think we can resist temptation. I do think we can live the way of love. But the way that some people have talked about entire sanctification just doesn't fit the way I and others live our lives. And so as a theologian in the classroom, I think we need to test our theology on lived experience. And I try to help my students to do that. Well, and that's such an important part of what we're called as the church to do, right? We've got obviously seminary educated pastors who, as you said, there's huge value in their ability to live in both worlds and to be able to communicate to those of us who maybe don't have the seminary background, but are really looking for those real life applicable truths Mm -hmm. that are made manifest in our everyday. So that's incredible. So you talked a little bit about your student being perhaps somebody who is dissatisfied with a belief structure that they grew up with. Can you tell us a little bit about the first time that you realized that there may be alternatives to the beliefs that you grew up with? Hmm. I don't know about the first time, but I grew up in a family in which my mother was Pentecostal holiness in her background, and my father was Dutch Reformed Calvinist. So they had come from different theological frameworks, and they both you know, found value in those frameworks, but also were open to new ideas. My dad was a fairly ecumenical kind of guy, even though he grew up Dutch Reformed. And he was ecumenical because he was a really good basketball player and all the churches in town wanted him to play on their team, you know, so (laughs) he got to hang out with other kinds of Christians. And my mom as a Pentecostal holiness thinker was always, you know, as a good Pentecostal looking for the new fruits of the spirit, see what the spirit is doing today. And so with that kind of an attitude, I think you're open to learning new things and and having new experiences. And so I think one of the gifts my parents gave me was the gift of being open to new ideas and being willing to set aside things that didn't seem to make sense or didn't seem to work in my life. Oh, that's great. 
I appreciate the background and setting the context for what has shaped you into the theologian you are today. So I remember one of the first times I saw you previously in California, but one of the more recent times I saw you was after I had just moved to Dallas the first time, and the Wesleyan Theological Society held their annual meeting at Perkins School of Theology. And I remember thinking, man, this guy is one of the preeminent Wesleyan scholars alive today and feeling some pride in being a Wesleyan. Why are you such a fan of John Wesley? Well, I think Wesley's got a lot of good things going for him. First of all, he tried to put the issues, themes of love at the center of his theology. And early on in my life, that was something that I tried to do. For me, it came in my reading of scripture and listening to Christian rock and roll. (laughs) I would go down to the Christian bookstore and I was trying to stay away from that, quote, secular music, you know, that was of the devil. (laughs) And so I would go to the Christian bookstore, but I wanted to rock. And so I would pick albums based on the length of the hair of the guys in the picture on the front (laughs) of the cover, you know. I want the hardest stuff out there because I want to rock. <laughs> and a lot of the good songs on those albums were songs about love, at least the ones that really seemed convicting, you know, the ones that were just trying to bash the head of the devil. Those got kind of old after a while. But there's something about the pull of love in those songs and then my reading of scripture that began to bring me to the view that love had to be the center Later on in my life, I was a really hardcore evangelist, and I did a lot of door-to-door witnessing. I was a part of Campus Crusade for Christ. And then I had a crisis of faith when I started reading a bunch of atheists and agnostics. And my last year of college, I, for the sake of intellectual honesty, became an atheist. And what brought me away from atheism and, quote, back to faith Well, there were several things, but at the center of it were the themes of love. I couldn't make sense of my deep intuitions that I ought to be a person who loves and other people ought to be loving people if there wasn't some grounding God, if there wasn't a God who grounded that intuition. And so then when I read in John Wesley, that for him, you know, love is God's reigning attribute and his theology is shaped profoundly by the convictions of love. He doesn't have a doctrine of eternal security like John Calvin would, you know, a God who who we can trust will, through power, keep us in the palm of his hand. He's got a God who provides Christian assurance based on the love of God that lures and calls and mm-hmm. and one of my favorite Wesleyan words, woos us. Mm-hmm. And so I was attracted to Wesley because of the centrality of love and other things like, you know, he believed in free will and he had an emphasis upon real transformation in this life and the importance of community, et cetera, et cetera. But I think love was probably number one. Well, it makes sense as to why that has been the topic of many of your books. <laughs> <laughs> yes, my wife, she says to me when a new book comes out, she says, is this another love book? <laughs> <laughs> Just another book about love. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm excited to talk to you about your most recent book, God Can't, How to Believe in God and Love After Tragedy, Abuse, and Other Evils. There is a lot to unpack there. (laughs) So what motivated you to write this book? Well, a few years ago, I wrote a book called The Uncontrolling Love of God that was Mm -hmm. published by InterVarsity Press Academic and was, even though I tried to make it fairly accessible, it was really in an academic press And quite a few people read that book and found help, especially people who had been abused or victims of tragedy or harmed in some way. And they would send me these notes, you know, like Facebook notes or emails talking about their horrific experiences and how this way of looking at God, a God who simply can't control others, was really helpful to them. And so with the encouragement of some friends and thinking through things, I thought, you know, I need to write a book that is very accessible, an example of public theology or or pastoral theology that includes a bunch of these stories that are true stories of people who are hurting, who have found this way of thinking about God helpful. 
And so that was a really primary motivator in writing this book, God Can't. Yeah, that's great. For the sake of our listeners, to give you some context to the book, I just want to point out that the book is based on these five premises. Number one, God can't prevent evil. Number two, God feels our pain. Number three, God works to heal. Number four, God squeezes good from bad. And number five, God needs our cooperation. I don't want to dive too much into each of them because I want our listeners to actually purchase the book and read it for themselves. It's just I found it to be a really valuable book. Very, nice. very fascinating read. But I want to ask right off the bat, the title, God Can't. Those two words, why do you think that gives us so much pause to even think about the title itself, God Can't? Yeah, I mean, I think the vast majority of people, no matter what tradition they've been raised in, the Christian tradition outside of Christianity, they begin with the premise that the word God must involve some sort of notion of a God who is almighty or omnipotent or sovereign or whatever word you like to use. And then they have this particular way of thinking about what that means. Our Calvinist brothers and sisters have a God who is in control of everything. And so they question that we really have genuine free will. But most people in America and I think around the world are not really attracted to the view that God does everything. A lot of people believe they have some measure of free will or something like free will. But they think that God allows for our free will, but could and maybe sometimes does control us. And so they'll say things like, well, God allowed that earthquake to happen or God allowed the accident for some greater purpose or, you know, God permitted her rape because of the free will of the rapist or whatever. And they have in the back of their mind, God could be in control and maybe sometimes is, but most of the time has a hands-off policy, sort of live and let live. You know, it's more loving for me to allow people to use their free will. I don't think that view is actually supported by the Bible. In fact, I think people bring that view of God to the Bible, but that's there. When they hear that God simply can't do something, they're like, okay, that can't be right because that goes against how I think about God and how I read the Bible. And a lot of people don't even realize that the Bible has quite a few passages that say God can't do something. So it's actually biblical to say God can't do something. Most of us are emphasizing all the things we think God can do because we want hope to get beyond, you know, our struggles, our difficulties, our sins, our bad habits, etc. So the idea that God can't do something, I admit, is pretty radical, but I think it's biblical. And as I argue in the book, it's the key to helping us get past a lot of really troublesome and vexing questions. So as you talk about the idea that God can't, surely that notion is sure to ruffle some feathers here and there. You know, we joke sometimes that politics and religion around the Thanksgiving table are the two things that you can't talk about, right? Because people have such different opinions about them. Surely none of us have experienced critics in our own context in the church. But if critics do come across, um, when we talk about some things that we might differ on philosophy-wise or theology-wise, what do you say to critics who might say, these ideas that you're talking about, the idea that God can't, are new ideas in theology, and you're not allowed to have new ideas in theology. What would you say to critics who might feel that way? Well, I have great respect for the past. I've already talked about how much I like John Wesley, and he's in the past. But I think that God doesn't stop revealing, and that we really can have new ideas that are more true than past ideas. Here, let me say it in a really radical way. I think it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle hmm. than for a thoroughgoing conservative to be a follower of Jesus Christ. <laughs> huh. Now, what I mean by that is that when I read the scriptures, Jesus is time and time again coming up with something new. There's like people are expecting X and it's Y. He's saying, you've heard it said, but I say unto you. Mm -hmm. And so Jesus is constantly going against the status quo. Now, sometimes he draws upon the past and finds something valuable there. So I'm not against everything in the past. I think there's lots of great things there. But if you think all the answers have already been provided, 
then you're a thoroughgoing conservative. And I think you're opposed to the very fundamental way Jesus exists in the world. Now, what some thoroughgoing conservatives will say is, well, of course, people in Jesus' time didn't understand things, but now Jesus tells us everything we need to know. And now all we have to do is transport that knowledge into today because it's already been you know, set up. 100% of it is in the box in the Bible or the tradition or whatever. And here I want to say we need to actually listen to our Pentecostal and charismatic brothers and sisters and say, you know, God can do new things. God can give new insights. We need to be humble when we think we have new insights that are better than old ones. But we don't have to shy away from saying God can still reveal new things today. So, Tom, going back to this title, God Can't, I had a question for you that came to my mind. Is there a distinguisher between God can't and God won't? Oh, great question. Yes, huge distinguisher. In the stories that I received from people who had read my earlier book, several victims of sexual abuse said that they especially appreciated the idea that God simply can't do something because they had been told that God won't do something. Mm. And to them, it sounded an awful lot like God could have stepped in and intervened in their situation, but God chose not to do so. God wouldn't prevent their horrors instead of couldn't prevent their horrors. But if God really loves us and those are really genuinely evil things, we would think that God would want to prevent all the genuine evils of the world. And I put sexual abuse amongst the genuine evils. So the stronger God can't language is actually comforting and reassuring to victims of evil because it says that God is not standing on the sidelines, able to intervene, but choosing not to but simply could not have prevented their suffering in the first place or in the midst of it. And actually, that reminds me of something, uh, a note I got in response to the God Can't book. Let me read a little portion of this letter, and I'll keep the writer of the letter anonymous. This is what she says. I want to tell you a bit about my story. I'm a survivor of sexual abuse. A lot and for a long time by my brother. A long time of suffering before I found any kind of freedom. In the midst of the worst years of my life, I had a dream straight from the heart of God. It was God walking over to my bed as I was being raped, and he simply reached out and held my hand and cried. For a few short days, I was elated God hadn't left me after all. He was right there, comforting me. Then I got angry. Angry that he was there, and instead of stopping it, he simply held my hand and watched. For a long time, years, I was angry about that. I prayed for a breakthrough. But now, realizing that I haven't been able to move past it, I came upon your book, Paging through it, praying through it, contemplating it, I can see more clearly what may have been happening. God could not stop my brother. He gave free will. How would you have stopped him? And the reality is, and this is what I'm working on and anchoring my soul into, she writes, is that God couldn't. Not that he didn't. And for me, this is a complete game changer. So you can see how that is so powerful for victims or survivors of horrific things. And we could go obviously beyond sexual abuse to all kinds of other tragedies, horrible things that happen in our world. If God has the kind of power to prevent them, but chooses not to do them, just sort of stands there and suffers with us, which I'm all about God suffering with Mm us. But if God could have prevented it and didn't, it doesn't sound like God is particularly loving. Wow, what an incredible letter. From the perspective of the author who has written this book, how does that make you feel to receive feedback like this, that you are actually changing people's lives as you help shape their perspective of what God can and can't do? 
amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You don't get these kind of letters when you write academic books. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I've written a lot of academic books in my life and they're important. I'm not trying to minimize them, but there's something especially satisfying about having a book that people read and it just changes their view of God in a radically positive way. Well, and as you say, there's a context, a time and place where academic books are hugely important, but books that really convict the heart are just a beautiful thing. So thanks again for sharing that. So do you talk a little bit about that story? And I'm sure there are countless others about the impact your book has made on other people's lives. How has your own understanding of who God is changed over your lifetime? And how has that impacted you personally? Well, I'm always learning and I never think I have it all figured out, but I do think I have new insights and better ways to think than I used to think. So when you ask me about how things have changed over my life, you know, I could think of a ton of examples, but let me go super vulnerable here and talk a little bit about my own life in the last four years. Hmm. I was laid off from the institution where I was a professor I think unjustly, and so does the vast majority of people who know the story. Mm. And that really hurt. (laughs) Mm. That hurt big time. I was uh, asked to go through a kind of a theological trial. I passed that trial, but the president laid me off anyway, and then he was later released, and it's a long story. But... In the midst of what seemed to me then and seems to me now and seems to the majority of people I talk to a very unfair, unjust, unloving, and in some instances, I think sinful on at least some people's parts, it was very helpful to me to believe that God wasn't orchestrating this. This wasn't God's plan for my life. And even that God wasn't standing by and permitting it to happen to me when God could step in there and fix some things. Because if God could do that, then I would have to say, this just doesn't make sense. A loving God wouldn't allow this kind of crap and this kind of pain and this kind of trauma in my life. And so for me personally, this particular view of God I had before going through all of this, but having this view was very helpful for me not becoming bitter towards God or, you know, angry at God I could continue to believe that God was the loving parent that I always thought God should be and was. Hmm, That is amazing. Thank you for sharing that and being open to sharing that open and honestly with us. It's interesting to think that the theology that you've been shaping over the course of your years in teaching then set the foundation for bringing you through that season. Yeah. I mean, more than anything else in my life, I want to live a life of love. I want to respond to the good things and the bad things in a loving way. And at the heart or the foundation of my motivation to be a loving person is my belief that there exists a God of love who empowers me to love, inspires me to love, sets the example of what love should look like. And that orients my entire life. Part of saying God can't. In the book, you also explain that God can't single-handedly. And I think this gets to the notion of God's cooperation with creation. And that idea gives me a sense of purpose and hope in life that we have a part to play in this. Would you mind expanding on what that means that God uses us and invites us into this process of healing? Yeah, I make the radical claim in the last chapter of this book that God simply can't get some things done in our lives and in the world unless we cooperate. Mm. A lot of people want to talk about our participating with God or, you know, responding to God's call. But in the back of their minds or in their view of God, they have a God who could get things done single-handedly, unilaterally, you know, get the job done all alone. And my view says that God actually needs our cooperation for love to rule, for love to reign. And this, I think, not only makes our lives significant, it also helps us make sense of life around us and our role in it. Hmm. 
And that means that when we wake up every morning, we go about our day, that what we do in life makes a difference now and in the future. And to me, that's a powerful view, not only of a loving God, but of our relationship as children of God. Oh, that's fascinating. Along those lines, you tell several stories about how you used to have a healing ministry and you used to have this refrain in your prayer that I have prayed myself historically, that when you pray for someone for their healing, you end it with this phrase, if it's your will. as kind of this disclaimer or this stay safe. If it's not your will, then it won't happen and it wasn't my fault for not praying correctly or something. Do you mind speaking to the cooperation that God invites us into in the healing process and, and what that looks like? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Last night, I got a note from a United Methodist pastor in the Portland area whose daughter had just gone through a really difficult time medically. And, and so we were talking about what healing looks like and miracles look like and, and talking about chapter three in this new book, God Can't, in which I talk about healing. I make the claim there that God always works to heal, always, everyone, all the time. But God simply can't heal single-handedly. God needs cooperation at various levels and complexities of existence. And what many people have done, at least in the churches I've been a part of, is say, you know, God is a healing God. God calls us to pray our prayers of healing and ask for God's healing power in our lives. But most of the time, those healing prayers don't seem very effective. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know about the three of you, but my success rate when it comes for healing prayers is in the single digits. I suck. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, I would be up around the altar at my church and we would be praying for someone's cancer or someone's, you know, disease or some problem. And we would be praying down God's Holy Spirit on our lives and in this person and believing God can do anything and wanting God wanting to heal, and then they wouldn't get healed. Mm -hmm. And so as a way to try to make God not seem like God is, you know, either playing favorites or asleep on mm -hmm. the job, we would add in that little extra phrase, well, if it's your will. And that was sort of a way of saying, well, maybe God's got this master plan that's kind of a secret and hidden. It's a mystery. And in some way, Aunt Mabel dying from cancer really is a good thing in God's secret plan. Maybe it really is God's will that Aunt Mabel die of cancer. And so sticking in that little phrase, if it's your will, is just sort of a cover your ass kind of phrase so that, you know, later on, you don't have to answer those tough questions of why God didn't heal in that moment. And as I mm -hmm. say in the book, I quickly decided that wasn't a good way to pray because it wasn't going to make sense, and I offer an alternative. Tom, what I love about our conversation today and what you've talked about in your book is that you take a concept that on the surface may seem helpless and make it very hopeful because of our capacity to be God's love in the world and our capacity to be in cooperation with what God calls us to in the world. So thank you so much for sharing today and for all of the insight. I know that I'm walking away with a lot to think about. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. Well, I appreciate this conversation we've had. And I really do think this book will push the vast majority of people to think in new ways, I think more helpful ways, and live life more fully in line with the way the world seems to work. And I think the way scripture talks about God. Mm. So we've got one last question that we ask every person who comes on the podcast. And that question is this, up until this point in your life, what is one thing that you wish someone would have told you? Hmm. <laughs> One thing I wish people had said to me. Maybe I, I wish people had told me early on that the church could be so powerfully helpful and formative in positive ways and so powerfully negative and destructive in powerful ways. I think I underestimated the power of the church. Wow, man, that's good. That's really <laughs> that good. good. Well, Dr. Ord, it has been an absolute pleasure getting to pick your brain a little bit. We appreciate the intellectual challenge 
that you've provided for us. And we're excited to dive into your book and hope that our listeners will do the same. So thank you so much for joining us here today. Thank you, Josh, Eric, Julie. I really enjoyed the conversation. Thanks again. Thank you. What a thought-provoking conversation with Tom about free will and about the role that God plays in depending on the philosophy that you take, the things that God can do or the things that God can't do. I think regardless as to where we fall on that particular subject, one thing that we can all agree on is that we have a role to play in the transformation of the world, that we have a cooperative part in the work that God does through our hands and our feet and our voices and our hearts to transform the world for the kingdom of Jesus Christ. In that spirit, we wanna leave you with a quote today by Teresa of Avila. She said these words, Christ has no body now but yours, no hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes through which he looks compassion on this world. Yours are the feet with which he walks to do good. Yours are the hands through which he blesses all the world. Yours are the hands, yours are the feet, yours are the eyes, you are his body. Christ has no body now on earth but yours. Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of More Than Sunday. If you like the podcast, please feel free to share it, go online and leave a comment or give us a rating so that others might hear about us too. We've got a new episode coming out every Wednesday, so make sure you also subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Play or Spotify to not miss our next episode. If you want to find out more about First United Methodist Church Richardson, you can find us online at fumcr.com as well as on Facebook and Instagram. Special thanks to Dr. Thomas J. Ord for joining us this week. And make sure and tune in next Wednesday when we have a conversation with Andrew Greer. Have a great week.